Okay, Dr. Gallagher, going on? Yeah, right. I'll just do it for one confirmation, and you should be live with the waves. Okay, yeah. And the sound is good. We should have a uh, Your voice needs to go up a little bit, I think. Come on. I was just testing my iPad, so it's going to go up. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Um, so uh, today we are actually doing something very different. Um, uh, you guys already, uh, uh, people who uh, follow us, you already know um, me uh, and Dr. Irgal. I'm uh, Kamal Erkin. I'm the uh, chairman of United Medical ACO. Volume. Um, you, can, you cannot hear me okay? I cannot hear you very well. All right, so let me just show this one. Is this better now? Much better. Okay, so apparently I couldn't, I mean, you guys couldn't hear me. Uh, so uh, a couple of my people are actually following. So if they can just text me if everything is good. So then I can actually, um, so Dr. Ray, you can hear me okay, right? Now I can hear you, yeah. So that's the most important one. So, um, all right, so we are gonna actually discuss something very different. Again, my name is Kamal Erkin. Uh, I'm the chairman of uh, United Medical ACO. And Dr. Uh, Isaias Ergao is uh, the president of CREAS. Uh, Dr. Ergao, if you please also introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Kamal. So I am uh, Dr. Uh, Isaias Ergao. I am the president of the Christiana Institute of Advanced Surgery and um, also its uh, co-founder. It's uh, the largest uh, uh, private surgical group with an interest in bariatric surgery in the tri-state area. I'm also the uh, medical director of bariatric surgery at the American uh, Surgery Center and uh, I'm the vice chair of the United Medical ACO as well. Thank you for having me, Kamal. Thank you, Dr. Gale. So today we are gonna discuss a very different topic. Um, and we decided to do this, uh, uh, actually it was just last night. And I have actually, I was informed by you um, uh, and I had to check, I thought it was only a couple of weeks ago, but it goes all the way back to November 9th and 10th, that time frame. And I was actually posting a lot of um, uh, different uh, news. I was sharing different news uh, from Twitter and uh, we just didn't realize how this issue is going to escalate. So we are talking about Ethiopia crisis in the Tigray region. Uh, well, I'm from Turkey, so I'm not from Ethiopia. So I have no uh, bias in this, but I do uh, have Dr. Irga, who's actually from that region. So Dr. Irga, if you can tell us a little bit about your background and why this is important for us to have this discussion today. Absolutely, absolutely. So Kamal, essentially, there is a uh, devastating humanitarian crisis that is essentially man-made. Uh, it's devastating because it's affecting 6 million people. Uh, it's a humanitarian crisis because uh, there is dire uh, need of uh, survival necessities for these people in terms of food, uh, water, um, medicines. Um, it is human-made because it is caused by a war that is going on uh, in that uh, uh, region of Ethiopia known as Tigray. Uh, and the, uh, probably the most tragic aspect of this is that this is uh, happening uh, completely uh, in total darkness uh, in that no major news outlet uh, is talking about it every day because the tragedy is occurring uh, every day. It has been occurring for the last 60 days essentially. And I think it is uh, very important for all of us uh, to raise this issue as, man as, as much as possible uh, because um, bad things ha are happening to uh, millions of people, Kamal. And as uh, uh, Martin Luther King said, uh, it's not the acts of bad people which are consequential sometimes, it's the silence of good people which are far worse. And I believe this is what is occurring right now. There is a uh, um, devastating uh, a war going on against 6 million people. And yet the world is going by as if nothing is happening in that region. So it is important for all people of uh, goodness and decency to really raise uh, uh, an alarm about this issue because help is desperately needed by these uh, people in Tigray. 
I can't hear you, come on. Sorry. Just, just for those uh, who, are, um, who are, who may not be very familiar with this one, uh, I do follow this YouTuber um, and I do want to kind of uh, share uh, how it's explained so then everyone can kind of understand what the issue is. So I'm going to go ahead and share my, um, uh, uh, okay, let's see. Okay, now we have that. Let me sh share my screen. Um, and I'm going to need James to let me know if he's able to hear the video. So that way, um, So Dr. Yao, in this video, um, I didn't turn it on yet. Uh, it explains um, uh, the Ethiopia, and then we're going to look into the um, Tigray region from this in independent uh, view, so that we can kind of understand what the background. Most people don't really know uh, what's happening uh, in Ethiopia. Most people probably don't know where Ethiopia is. I mean, honestly, especially in the United States. So I'm going to play this for everyone, so that we can have a good, clear background. Sure. is really awesome guy. I actually reached out to Abdul to see if he'd like to be in this video. He said yes. Abdul, say hi. Hello, this is Abdullahi uh, from Ethiopia, land of origins. Uh, I met uh, Caleb and Paul last year while they were visiting Ethiopia. Thanks, Abdul. For those who don't know, Ethiopia kind of has like a very reputable position in the African continent. It was never fully colonized. Like the Italians took a stab at it for like five years, but it didn't really work out. Fascinating so, place, both in the city and the countryside. And what's even more interesting is that each region of Ethiopia has such a fascinating story in contrast with people, groups, and languages. We have four main ethnic families, the Habesha, Omoric, Nilotic, and Cushitic. You can travel less than 20 miles and find a completely different people group with a different writing system system and language and cultural tradition than the one that you just passed through. It's amazing how the country holds itself together. Today, there are 10 regions or Kili. Keep in mind, actually, in June of 2020, the Sidama zone actually got upgraded into a region, making it the newest region. And in addition, they have two charter cities, which act like regions. And on top of that, you have 10 special waredas, which are like districts within the regions that have their own autonomy and don't act the same as the regions. It's confusing. Here's a list of all 10 of them. We don't have time to get into it. All right. And before we jump into it, just want to that this episode is brought to you by Sykes' Glass. So uh, now here is the Tigray. Uh, Dr. Ray, you can hear me okay, right? Yes, yeah. All right, so. Uh, of Axel, around uh, one century AD, distinguished by its rocky own architecture in which entire buildings and churches were just carved out of the rock. This was where some of the earliest Ethiopian history begins. And, uh, uh, and, fi yeah, here is. and finally, the Tigray region. And here we go again. Abdul, take it away. Tigray, Magale. This is the northernmost region. Uh, this is a very cool one. Uh, the area is inhabited mostly by the Tigray people. And they're basically the closest cousins to the Amharas, both mostly Orthodox, ethnically Habesha, their uh, languages are partially intelligible, and they even write uh, in the same script, the Gilles. The Tigray region is blessed with some of the most contrasting landscape and the historical landmarks. You have the upper plateau and mountains like uh, Saramba and Ambalaje, but uh, the most notable thing about the Tigray region is its landmarks and monuments that date back to the kingdom of Aksum around uh, one century AD. Distinguished by its rocky own architecture in which entire buildings and churches were just carved out of the rock. This was where some of the earliest Ethiopian history begins and uh, archaeological sites pop up more and more over time. So yeah, there you go. Those are the regions and charter cities of Ethiopia. For what it's worth, Thank I'm you, Kamal. That was very good. Glad to have you. That was excellent. I mean, actually, this guy is really uh, cool. He has done all the countries in the world. So if you get bored, um, you should probably just follow him. Uh, it's, a, it's good refreshing the education that we already, uh, we should already have. Uh, so when I get bored, I do launch him. Now, um, so going back to why we are here today again, um, when this issue started, um, we really just don't understand when we are right now in our comfortable places or homes and um, when, when we don't really see from the media what's really happening, then we, we assume that nothing is happening. And we have a big problem with this. Now, Dr. Gai, you are someone from this region. I know your uh, whole um, life, uh, like what you have told me uh, so far. And when I had this, uh, when I received this news, it was more traumatizing for me because 
I knew uh, what's happening. Uh, I knew what was the background of the place. And now going through the same issue is extremely devastating. Now, uh, you have recently sent a letter uh, to one of the editors, uh, uh, news journals, uh, editors, um, and we have not gotten any response yet. But we also reach out to Senator Chris Coombs and Tom Harper together. Um, so what do you have to say? Just uh, tell us what's happening so that we can kind of share a couple of the other news. And uh, I have a couple other questions after that. Absolutely. So the letter that uh, you described is a letter I wrote recently, um, uh, really following a press conference that was given by the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization. Uh, the Director General of the World Health Org Organization is a, a very well-known uh, public health expert. Uh, his name is Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. And uh, he's done uh, remarkable work uh, in terms of reduction of infant mortality, uh, maternal mortality in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, he was chosen to become the uh, Director General of WHO and uh, his uh, uh, first year in ter uh, first uh, term was obviously, uh, um, uh, you know, an encounter with the coronavirus pandemic. So he's got his hands full, essentially. But when he was uh, asked recently to uh, summarize what 2020 meant to him, obviously the pandemic issue was central to his assessment. But then he gave a fairly brief introspection about some personal pain that he has been going through recently. Uh, Dr. Tedros Adhanom is from Tigray, from this region of Ethiopia that we were describing. And he said that it's painful for him to see that his people are being, uh, uh, you know, uh, under uh, this uh, devastating war currently. And uh, for him personally, this also meant that he has not been able to really have any news about his own family. Particularly, he mentioned that his brother, who lives in the capital city of Tigray, Magale, he does not know his whereabouts. And that resonated with me as well, because uh, I do have extended families throughout Tigray, particularly in the Adwa region, and I have not been able to get in touch with them since the war started in November 4 of, this, of 2020. And that is because this war is not only devastating, but it has been conducted in total darkness. In other words, the government of Ethiopia under Prime Minister Abiy is conducting this war after blockading the area completely from the rest of the world from a communication point of view, but also blocking you know, uh, provisions of food, medicines, obviously no electricity, no water. Uh, and these people have been cut off completely. And then of course the war fell upon them. Uh, so for all of us uh, of uh, Tigray and origin that are outside Tigray, we have no idea. The rest of the world obviously does not know the extent of the, uh, of the, of the, of the devastation. But for us who are you know, related to, to, to Tigray from a family point of view, we don't know where our family uh, uh, members are essentially because they could be dead or could be alive. We don't know. Recently, you know, two, three months ago, we were worried about the impact of the coronavirus on them. Now we, we really do not know whether they are alive. Okay. And yeah, that's um, what really sparked that letter. I'm so sorry, but um, <laughs> like, well, you just said it and then we probably heard that a little bit casually. And then, um, and I was trying to actually show the, um, the news that you were referring to, but then you mentioned your own family. When we receive these types of news, uh, usually our um, position, especially in the United States is, well, it's not happening. Oh, well, that's not what's really happening. You really need to know exactly what's going on. Now, I just want to ask you uh, so that you can maybe repeat that. So you have family in the Tigray uh, region, yeah. right? So I, I do. I, I mean, I don't, right? So I wouldn't be able to say for sure, but you have uh, your own family and you're not able to communicate with these uh, people. Yeah. And I for almost two months? It's almost two months? Yes, it's almost two months. The war started on November 4 and the blockade of communication, uh, you know, telecommunication, internet, everything has been cut off by the government of Ethiopia. So there is no access. The people who are there who are suffering under the war cannot access the outside world to tell their stories. 
Well, so we can, cannot okay, communicate with our family members, essentially. Dr. 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 how can we just really sit and do nothing when you say, I mean, you and I, um, we've known each other for 20 years. Uh, you, in the United States, you are a physician, you're a surgeon, you are one of the uh, best in your uh, uh, specialty. Thank you. In, in the nation. So, and now yet we are still discussing these types of issues and then also how silence uh, everyone else is. Now, I do want to point out one of the big uh, problem that I have is, and as you and I, we discuss, this guy actually has a Nobel uh, Peace uh, Prize, right? So he's the winner of 2019, I believe. 19, yeah. This guy is the, the guy, uh, the Ethiopian um, prime minister. And, and why, why did he get that again, Dr. Rida? So the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed in 2019 because he uh, initiated and uh, finalized a peace agreement uh, with the uh, state of Eritrea, which is a state that is north of uh, Ethiopia, and which has been in a state of war for the last 20 years, essentially. So as soon as Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power about two years ago, that's one of the first things that he accomplished. And he received, uh, obviously, uh, a lot of uh, accolade from the world, and that culminated with him being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and um, obviously, uh, the most tragic part about this, Kamal, is that the uh, person with whom he made peace, which is the uh, president of Eritrea, which is Isaiah Saforki, is actually his ally now in this conduction of this war. So they made peace, but they also made a pact of war, right? That's, that's the tragedy of this, because now the war against Tigray is being conducted by the Federal Army of Ethiopia, which is under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, and then by the Eritrean army that came from the north and then invaded Tigray, and then on top of that, we have militias from neighboring state in the Amhara who participate in the war as well. And so there are three allies participating in this war against the people of Tigray. And on top of that, they are supported technologically by uh, non-African countries like the United Arab Emirates that is actually uh, sponsoring drone attacks uh, in Tigray. So you have a population of 6 million that are being attacked by three sides, essentially, the Ethiopian federal uh, government's army, the Eritrean army, the militia from Amhara, and the technological support from you know, wealthy Middle Eastern countries. And when all these are real weapons and bombs fall, obviously there is going to be devastation and the tragedies. We don't know the extent of this devastation because no independent media outlet has been allowed by the Ethiopian government to assess the situation, let alone media outlets, even humanitarian organizations have not had full access to tell us really the extent of the devastation right now. What we know right now, Kamal, is that there have been over 60,000 people who fled into neighboring Sudan from Tigray, right? And they are telling tales of horror, right? Escaping from brutal killings, escaping ethnically uh, uh, um, directed uh, massacres. Uh, these are the tales that these refugees are telling when they reach Sudan, right? Well, there are humanitarian organizations who tell us that up to 2 million children are in dire need of help from food and medicines in Tigray. Uh, there are organizations that uh, look at the risk of genocide in the world and they've raised the crisis level, the alarm level for possible genocide in Ethiopia to the highest level. These are organizations that have been uh, in place obviously since the uh, Rwanda situation in Africa and they're really looking for possible dangers of genocide in Africa and they've raised the level of alertness in Ethiopia to the highest level. So there is really, really, really a lot of danger here affecting 6 million people. So, Dr. Gal, just so that we actually have a better understanding of um, uh, having a good, maybe, perspective of this. So, mm -hmm. uh, 
from what I understand, uh, Ethiopia, uh, the structure in Ethiopia is pretty similar to the United States. Mm -hmm. So there are 10 uh, almost states. Yes. It's like we have 50 here, right? So, yeah. um, uh, and each state has its own government. They make yes. own, their, uh, they, have all, they have their own autonomy. Yeah. So now if, this would be almost like if, let's say, uh, I'm going to use uh, one of the states on the south side, I mean, southern uh, US, uh, let's say uh, New Mexico, right? I think New Mexico is on the border. Yeah. So hopefully I'm right. So, yes, yeah, uh, you are. Now, t can you just, you know, explain this from the United States perspective, what it is like if New Mexico was doing what Tigray is doing? Absolutely. And and that's right what's happening with the election, by the way, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is very normal to have the federal government led by a party, okay, a particular party, political party. And then you can have a state like New Mexico, which may have a completely different party at the helm, right? The governor, the legislator could be different. This is normal here. It's accepted. The United States government would accept this. They have differences. They may have differences in how to conduct you know, the coronavirus situation. They may have differences on how to look at environmental issues and other issues, right? But they work together, they accept, right? The United States, the federal government accepts what the New Mexico people choose as their governor, right? And there is no issues. Well, in Ethiopia, you have, you know, the Tigray region has voted recently, actually, uh, during the coronavirus, they have voted their own government, their own leaders. So these leaders have a very different view on how Ethiopia should go ahead and Tigray should go ahead. And the government in Ethiopia led by Abiy Ahmed has a different view, right? You would think this is normal. It's called politics, right? You deal with it. You are a politician. You're not expecting everybody to have the same view as you are. You have different political view, you work together, but you accept the will of the people. If the Tigrayan people have chosen their own leaders, the central government has to accept it. That's the way it should be. Well, not for Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. He decided that he did not like the leaders that were chosen by the people of Tigray, right? And he accused them of treason. He came up with some excuses and then he decided to attack them. So in an alternate reality, if this were to happen in the United States, what would happen? Would happen what would happen is that the federal government in the United States does not like the governor of New Mexico. So what it does is it mobilizes the, the United States Army. It asks the Mexican government at the South to help it, right? So the Mexican government would send its troops to New Mexico. The United States Federal Army would, the US Army would go into New Mexico. And then militias from a neighboring state like Texas would be mobilized as well. And all these three would attack the New Mexico government. That's exactly what's happening in Tigray right now. The federal government's army, right? The uh, government of Eritrea, which is a neighboring country, has sent its army. And then the militias from a neighboring state, the state of Amhara, are also part of this war. So this is a war being conducted against a single state because there are political differences, right? Now, you would expect somebody who has won the highest price on earth for peace would choose any means but war first to resolve political differences. Well, not uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. In fact, he has disregarded any mediation efforts and he went to war immediately. Now, like a lot of dictators in the past, he had to be, come up with some excuse to do this. He accused the leaders of Tigray of doing this or that, right? Well. You know, when Hitler invaded Poland, he had to come up with some excuse first, right? He said, well, there were some German people who had been maltreated by the Polish government, and then he sent his own army, right? We've heard, this is really a classic, you know, example of how to start a war, right? If you want to start a war, you come up with some excuse, and then you start it, right? And that's exactly what happened. But obviously, the tragedy, Kamal, is that this war, although it was prosecuted on November 4th in total darkness, it has been in preparation for months or even years before that. So the excuse that the government came up to really start the war is really not an excuse because the preparation had been happening before. 
Why do we know that? Well, we know, for instance, that before the war started, federal funding to the Tigray state, state had been cut, right? Um, transportation, banking system, and all these things have been taken away from Tigray. And the isolation of that region was started way before the actual uh, bombardment started, right? So, so that is the, essentially the, what is happening in that area. One of the main reasons also, uh, of course, we have so many different reasons, but you and I, we are not uh, politicians. Uh, so we are here because the, uh, what type of uh, tragedy this becomes uh, on our society, in our mm -hmm. society. And uh, we look at this in so many different ways. Uh, when you look at it from the children's standpoint, uh, based on the BBC news, uh, it's about 2.3 million kids being affected from this. So this is not the war between two military, but this is uh, the war on uh, one strong military on the, uh, the, uh, the common people in uh, Tigray, right? Yes, uh, absolutely. Casualties. Like this is this is just so like you know what this reminds me of is the Bosnia war. Yeah. And what I'm what I'm afraid of, and this always happens. They wait too long, the Western countries, uh, United Nations, um, uh, they, why do they have to wait so long to actually act when you know that, it, like when we have, uh, you know, two people uh, uh, lose their lives in the United States, it becomes a big deal. But yes. there's a car bomb in Pakistan, no one cares. So, and this is like the reality, like, is one uh, life here worth, uh, better than, uh, it has better value than the, Live in uh, uh, lives in you know uh, Africa or Asia. So I think our issue is I mean you and I we were discussing not just for the Ethiopia issue, all the other problems that we have. This almost becomes if you have power you are right. If you are if you have power you can do everything and that has to that has to stop. We actually have this in our uh, in our own field right in the healthcare field the giant hospital systems can just take all the credits uh, and they don't care about the private practices uh, who do uh, most of the work. So, uh, and I'm just, I feel like it's just going back to the same issue again. So Bosnia was the big, biggest disasters uh, in the recent history. And the action was taken, but it was already too late because I think like more than 100,000 people died. So why do we have to wait that long to get to this? Now, you know, one of the other things, I'm just going to go back to the Nobel um, Peace Prize. So why do they have to make this so quick without seeing so, the decision so quick, yeah. without seeing yeah. the impact long term, if it's really working or not? So you're just giving this, maybe this guy is doing, the prime minister of Ethiopia is doing this because he is recognized by the uh, Nobel, right? So then he just doesn't care. Absolutely, absolutely. So the question uh, that you raised actually at the beginning is related to this last point that you made, Kamal, right? Why is the world being quiet about this, right? Why aren't more Ethiopians from Central Ethiopia, for instance, raising their voice in opposition to what's happening in their own country, right? Why are many good people quiet and silent when so many Tigrayans are suffering, right? One of the reasons might be that the fact that Mr. Abi, uh, I mean, uh, Abi Ahmed received the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, may have hoodwinked them into thinking that whatever he's doing must be okay, right? Mm -hmm. So the Nobel Peace Prize may have given him legitimacy, right? And gave him cover to do what he's doing right now. So really, this could be, in fact, a problem that the Nobel committee itself cannot escape from, right? By giving this prize to this person and by really not saying much right now about it, they are giving legitimacy to this guy. So how, how is this action of the Nobel Prize Committee not consequential to the suffering of the people of Tigray? A mother who has lost her son in Tigray right now because of the war. A father who has lost his children in Tigray right now because of the war. Why is the action of the Nobel Committee not consequential to them, right? Could it be that they, 
action of the Nobel Committee has resulted in the deaths of these people because that Nobel Prize may have emboldened the Prime Minister of Ethiopia to really proceed with this action instead of finding a peaceful solution because they may be covering him, right? So there is, that is one consequence of the Nobel Committee's action. The second consequence of the Nobel Committee's action, come on, which is really tragic, is that they gave the prize because he made peace with Eritrea. Now, Eritrea happens to be a country that is compared to North Korea in terms of the suppression that goes inside that country. It is led by one of the most brutal con dictators in Africa, right? Well, Mr. Abiy made peace with him. And yet that peace pact is allowing him now to borrow soldiers and army from Eritrea and bringing them into Tigray to suppress his own people. The army from Eritrea has been brutalized by years of service and it's conducting unthinkable, unthinkable acts of uh, violence on the people of Tigray. The reports that are trickling down about killing of civilians, looting of businesses, devastation of public uh, property is unimaginable. And it's being conducted by this borrowed soldiers, borrowed army from a neighboring state under the watch of the Ethiopian army. So Prime Minister Abiy not only received a prize, right, to get cover for his actions, but the peace pact that earned him the prize allowed him to borrow soldiers to conduct this war. So there is a dual responsibility for the Nobel Committee on what is happening in Tigray. So the Nobel Committee really right now either have to make a statement by taking back that prize, or if they feel that it has no precedence and they cannot do it, then maybe they should not award the peace prize this year and get the money, the award that was supposed to be spent for the future Nobel Prize winner, give it to the charities that are working with the people of Tigray right now. That's the minimum they can do because their actions have consequences, have had consequences on the people of Tigray. So, um, you know, again, I just want to go back to uh, your own uh, personal um, uh, experience with this type of situation uh, in yeah. your past. Yes. Uh, and if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions, what you went through. I mean, when you never told me your real story, like it, until I met one of your friends, you and I, we met, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, it was at the airport. Amania, Amania in uh, Houston. Yeah. So, and uh, it was just kind of interesting because um, we were uh, traveling for one of the health, uh, healthcare conferences and this guy uh, just approached us. Um, and, you know, uh, I said, okay, well, he probably doesn't know Dr. Irgao. And then because he, you have the United Medical Jacket on, and then yeah. he, he just approached you because you thought, he thought he, you were a doctor. So, and I was just really like, I, I still um, feel guilty about that. So then, then you couldn't remember him right away. Yeah. And then, then you remembered him. So he knew you from your elementary school, from your childhood, right? A middle school, middle school, middle yeah. School. yeah. yeah. And yes, yeah. then, then our flight was canceled, uh, it was delayed, and then we had dinner together. And yep. first time I was hearing the entire story, um, and, uh, you know, it was in a restaurant uh, at the airport, and most of uh, my friends would know that I would never have any PDA, any public display of affection. And I remember crying and running to the bathroom because it was so sad. So yep. you know this from first hand, Dr. Gal. can you just... Uh, and if, if it's not too personal, can you just tell us what these people are going through today in the refugee camps and other situations while they're experiencing this? Absolutely, absolutely. So essentially this rings really very strongly towards uh, me because as a youngster, I went through the same situation when the Ethiopian army led by a different dictator at that time, Mengistu Haile Mariam, this is over 40 years ago, instead of finding a political solution for the uh, uh, Eritrean problem, it decided to send its army, right, and fight. But it was fighting the people who wanted self-determination. It was fighting the civilians. So the army was conducting the war by suppressing the civilians. So the army showed up in my house one night, right, at around 9 p.m., 
and uh, I was about 15, and they shot my dad right in front of me, in front of my mother. Uh, I'm going to show you the picture of my dad. I don't know if I showed it to you before. That's him. Yeah, that's him. Uh, my dad was in his mid-40s when he was killed. He was a very gentle, very nice person. He was an electrician. I was about 15 years old. I'm the second oldest in the house. And the soldiers that were part of a government that were supposed to protect us, government soldiers, came in into our house, right? They asked us to give them uh, the rebels, the weapons, just like Prime Minister Abiy, uh, uh, you know, ordered the people of Ma'ale to hand over the, the, their leaders or he was going to bomb the, the city, right? Just like that, they came to our house, the soldiers of the government of Ethiopia, who was supposed to be the government of that country and city at that time, they came to our house and my dad, who was not a political person, right, never been in politics, but spoke Tigrinya, which is the language of that area, right? And as soon as he opened his mouth, they shot him. And they killed him right there in our house, right? And my mother and seven of her children and uh, my grandmother, all of us, we spent the whole night with his body, right? With no help. Who are we going to get help if the government itself has sent its troops to kill us, right? Mm -hmm. So when the government wages army against its own people, it is a problem. Come on. There is no po problem that justifies a government killing its own people. It is ordinary people like my father who are being slaughtered in Tigray right now, right? And it is children like myself who are losing their parents right now. I went through that. And then the other thing that rings true, Kamal, is because of that war, after my dad was killed, because a lot of youngers my age were being killed by the army, my mother had to smuggle me away. I had to run away from home, cross miles of wilderness for weeks, and cross into the Sudan, and I became a refugee at the age of 16 to escape that. So when I hear refugees running into the Sudan to escape murder, that rings very real to me because I went through that. Your siblings were in different places. You guys were right. not together, right? No, absolutely. I mean, you know, I ran away. I left the family by myself because youngsters like myself, teenagers like myself, were being killed by uh, Ethiopian uh, government soldiers inside Asmara, the city I used to live in, right? And, th and then I became a refugee and I spent almost two years as a refugee in the Sudan at the age of 16 by myself. So what is happening to people of Tigray? How their life is being disrupted by the actions of their own government, right? So good people, decent people should not be quiet when this is happening. Good Ethiopians all over Ethiopia should not be quiet when this is happening. Good people around the world should not be quiet when this is happening. That is why it is important. And I felt good, for instance, that in our state, one of the first legislators, United States legislators to really spoke about this was Senator Kunz, right? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and we've sent letters to Senator Carper as well. And, uh, you know, we want, of course, things are very busy in the United States right now, and I understand, but we, there is a sense of urgency. Otherwise, you know, things that have happened uh, in other places like Rwanda could happen in Tigray as well. When you have a full army of a dictatorial regime from Eritrea deployed inside Tigray and having unfettered access into the cities and having unregulated, uh, you know, uh, um, oversight of that whole region with nobody stopping them. When you have the Ethiopian army, when you have ethnically motivated militias and nobody doing anything, it is, it is tragic. Come on, that's why uh, I, am, I appreciate very much that after our uh, uh, talk last night, you and I decided to do this. And if we can contribute even a little bit to the awareness of this tragedy in the world, I think it's worth it, come on. And uh, that's kind of our goal with this session today. Uh, Absolutely. We always discuss medical uh, issues, uh, healthcare related items, topics. So um, we wanted to make sure that anyone who's following, if, uh, who's watching these, who's following us, if they have the awareness of it and if we get the support of the, uh, our um, state senators, uh, any of the, uh, the officials in the state, 
who can actually put you know, pressure on the United Nations in this one, uh, or like whatever is happening there, because this is happening not just with one country, right? There's the support of um, uh, other countries who are actually being part of this, who are supporting this. You know, like they're supporting, they're on the wrong side of this. And yes. I think the United States uh, has a great responsibility Absolutely. Uh, in this Absolutely. Uh, responsibility in a way that we are responsible. The responsibility is to help. Not we are not saying that we are responsible for what's happening, but we have the responsibility of helping these uh, situations when um, this uh, issue is at a le- at the level that it is today. Two months after that, like two months ago, you told me this issue, yep. and we still discuss it. And you know, uh, I can't help but question the timing of this because it started on November fourth, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yep. And that's the time of our election year. So absolutely. I wonder if they just deliberately have done this. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you know, like everyone is busy. All like we, yeah. we have our yeah. own election to yeah. finalize, yeah. and we yeah. may be in a situation uh, like who's, who knows this week what's going to happen uh, with the uh, with what's happening with the Republicans. Uh, you know, maybe they just pick this time. Okay. No one is going to pay attention to this. Let's just do whatever we can. And that's not excusable. And um, we are not going to be quiet about these things. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the timing is cynical. The timing was November 4th, when the United States was completely preoccupied with an extremely difficult election, right? So they, they started the war at that time, knowing that there will be much less attention, of course, with the world occupied with the coronavirus. But you see this kind of cynical ways of prosecuting wars against people by dictators around the world. For instance, one of the tragic examples I do remember, Kamal, is that in Eritrea, right, of where we have this dictator, we've had this dictator for a long time, right after 9-11, right, when the world was really preoccupied with issues, the dictator actually moved in to suppress all his opponents, put all the people that were, uh, you know, raising alarm about his dictatorial attitudes, he put them in jail right then. Well, there was very little reaction at that time because the world was preoccupied with 9-11. So dictators are very cynical in the way they conduct these actions, particularly actions that affect thousands, if not millions uh, of people. So their choice of November 4th was not by accident, Kamal. It, it was really planned. And that shows you also that the excuse that they gave that they are doing this because the government of Tigray did this or that is just a mere excuse. And in fact, you know, you don't conduct a war of this scale involving three armies, the federal Ethiopian government army, the army of the Eritrean government and the militias from neighboring states, you know, just because uh, uh, you feel that some leaders of a place did uh, something illegal. So uh, the war is never gonna be an answer for um... Uh, civilian uh, issue, you know that, right? The war is not going to bring the peace. Uh, this is this is uh, kind of very clear. We have seen this in so many different ways, and we want to make sure that we are doing our part. Um, you and I, uh, we, uh, we actually financially we put support into this. There are some uh, organizations which we should share uh, yeah. for everyone to maybe help because. There's a huge refugee uh, crisis, um, yeah. and uh, the support that they need, and you know, it's it feels. Um, I mean, I feel extremely guilty for not being able to do anything when all these things are happening there, and every life, uh, every human being is important. So it's not yes. it doesn't matter which country we live in, uh, and just because we have power doesn't mean that we can do whatever we need to. We can. Uh, so that has to stop. The war has to stop. And absolutely, can, absolutely, we absolutely. Our, we can get the attention of our uh, locals here. Um, I know Chris Kuhn is working on this, yeah. Um, and but I know that they are also busy with uh, what's happening on their own side. So uh, no, no, that's we, understandable. But I think it's also raising public awareness. I would like people to really tweet hashtag Stop Tigray Genocide, for instance, which is an important hashtag. Hashtag Stop Tigray Genocide. That will raise awareness and prevent really a tragedy from extending way beyond to what it is right now. Okay. Uh, and as you said, financial aid is also going to be needed. It's going to be massive. We have to help all international organizations that are working hard to help the people of Tigray. Very, very important. 
Well, uh, Dr. Gao, thank you. Uh, I, I, you know, I do at least feel a little bit better just so that we have some contribution to this in, in a different way, just mm -hmm. to uh, make the awareness, uh, uh, increase the awareness. Uh, and Absolutely. hopefully uh, we can get better um, support from all different um, parts of the world and we can stop this madness. Absolutely. I think we should, uh, we should do a follow-up, Kamal, at some point also Absolutely. for us to be able to keep uh, the awareness going because obviously, you know, as we speak, people are dying. As we speak, people are suffering. As we speak, people are running away from their homes. That's so that, that doesn't stop for them. You know, the war is ongoing. So follow-up uh, follow would be great. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, so thank you, Kamal, as usual. I appreciate yeah. very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Take care. Have a nice week. Bye-bye.